I begin by quoting our presiding bishop in one of his sermons sometime last year, and I quote, he said, we have an invitation from God to leave our comfort zones and allow him to disturb us, to have a great anticipation and hope of what he could do in us and through us, end of quote. Everybody has a comfort zone. There is a certain temperature at which we feel the most comfortable. There is a way in life in which we feel at ease. There is a crowd of people in whom when we are with that crowd, we are so comfortable. When we are around the wrong crowd, in the wrong situation, in the wrong place and doing the wrong things, we can feel very uncomfortable and out of place. But when we find ourselves outside our comfort zone, we can become a little nervous. There is nothing wrong with this. It just proves that we are interested in being comfortable. However, there is a sense when comfort can become a thing of concern. It is easy to reach a place as individuals where we become satisfied with what we call the status quo. We so structure our lives to the point we can almost predict what will happen from one day to the next. We can predict what will happen in the service. We even can predict what time the offering will be taken and what time the speaker will come on, on board and what time the service will end. And so we have so structured our lives to an extent that if the Holy Spirit decided to visit us at eight, he will find nobody in this place. And we call it sitam. We are structured. And we keep time. Which is not a bad thing. For many, this kind of stability provides a deep sense of security and well-being. And there is nothing wrong with that. It is when this same type of comfortable living invades our spiritual life that will cause us trouble. There is nothing wrong with being satisfied with your job. There is nothing wrong with being satisfied with your marriage or with your service to the Lord. There is nothing wrong with being comfortable with your car or your financial standing. But when you become complacent about your prayer life and satisfied about your spiritual progress, then you need to move out of your comfort zone. You need to do what Pastor Buire is helping us do, recalibrate in his presence. We should never reach a place as a child of God where we are totally satisfied with our work and our witness to the lost and dying world. If any Christian had ever reached a place where he could be satisfied with his progress, it was one Apostle Paul. Yet he remained unsatisfied and always reached for more as we read in Philippians 3, 12 to 14 and we might jump there at some point in time. Not only do many individuals have uh, live in a spiritual comfort zone but so do many churches. When the attendance is up and the offerings are good we may be tempted to back off and take it easy. We may not pray for the church as we should pray. We may not invite others to join us as we should. Reverend Brere, I was so impressed to see that you even make sure that even the visitors know our vision and our mission. Friends, let me tell you, we can never run away from our mission because our mission is to know God and make him known through evangelism and discipleship. When we meet as safari groups, when we meet as various ministries here, every day and every week, we must remember our mission. Now that I have known God, I must make him known. Now that I know him, I must make him known. And how do we do it? through evangelism and discipleship. We may not be as active as we should. 
And it is so easy to become satisfied with the way things are. But the sad truth is this. When a church and a church family become complacent, that church begins to die. It may take years before the final death kennel is sounded, but the church begins to die when she becomes satisfied with her spiritual level and her growth. So what do we do? To move out of our comfort zone. How do we get ourselves out of our comfort zone? I think the answer is found in the theme of this revival week. Recalibrating in his presence. In this prayer of Moses, we can see some facts that can help us move out of our comfort zones. Both as individuals and also as a church. Let's notice a few facts as we think about recalibrating in his presence. But I will not do this message justice if I don't give a definition of recalibrating because I have been seeing people ask on social media, what is that? And so let's answer them, Pastor Buire. Recalibrating can refer to various contexts. So I'll provide a general response. In a broad sense, recalibrating means making adjustments or fine-tuning a system, a process or strategy to achieve better results or align with new circumstances. It involves reevaluating and adjusting the parameters or setting to optimize performance or address changes. In a personal or professional context, recalibrating can refer to reassessing goals or priorities or strategies to adapt to changing circumstances, overcome challenges, or achieve better outcomes. So overall, recalibrating involves a process of analysis, adjustment, and refinement to enhance performance, accuracy, or effectiveness. But let's contextualize and look at what is spiritual recalibration. It relates to an individual assessing their spiritual work with the Lord and making adjustments to improve it resulting in their revival. And as a result, Christian revival refers to a spiritual awakening or renewal among Christians characterized by an increased interest in spiritual matters, a deepening tr uh, of faith and commitment to personal and social transformation. And of course, you know, if we manage, if we succeed, to recalibrate in his presence, a number of things are going to happen. There is going to be spiritual renewal. There is going to be personal transformation. There is going to be community impact. Remember, one of our core values is community. How do we impact the community in Eldoret if not pioneer estate? It can only happen if we recalibrate in his presence. Although newlyweds may not understand this, those of us that have been married for a few decades, just a few weeks ago, this month of June, I realized I've been married to Helen for the last 27 years. you'd realize that romance is not totally effortless. To keep the romantic fires burning over the years requires deliberate forethought and attention. It's the same spiritually. To keep your relationship with the Lord fresh and vital over the long haul, it's not automatic. It requires forethought. It requires effort. It requires constant attention. It's easy to be lured into complacency, into your Christian life. Things, even good things, become a routine. And you can tell people, I did my quiet time. And you put a tick. You can tell people, I was in church last Sunday. And I'm coming this Sunday. And you put a tick. And you can tell people, I gave my tithes and offerings. 
But as you do that, you realize that you've drifted into not actively pursuing to know God more deeply. I believe that was the case with the church at Ephesus because even when John the Revelator writes, he talks some nice things in, about the church at Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2. He says, I know your works, I know your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear with those who are evil and you have tested those who say are apostles and are not and have found them liars. And you have persevered and you have patience. You see, these are nice things that are being talked about the church at Ephesus. But then he comes to verse 14, he, verse 4, he says, Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Yes, you are doing well, Sita Meldoret. You have everything in place. Hmm? As a matter of fact, you are celebrating 10 years in September. So you are doing well. Everything seems to be working and you have everything in place. You have a nice stage. You have a nice auditorium. So you are doing great. But then, the church at Ephesus is told, nevertheless, even in all these things, I have something against you. If my English professor, Professor Joshua Buhasa was here, he would tell me, when nevertheless is used in a sentence, it kind of nullifies what had been said earlier. When the Apostle Paul wrote to Philippians, he had been a Christian for about 25 years. He had, God had used him to perform many mighty miracles. He had several encounters with the risen Lord, including being caught up into the third heaven. But he didn't rest in those experiences. He said that he wanted to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. Then I add, excuse me, brother Paul. Excuse me, Bishop Paul. I thought you knew him. You know him. You have gone to the third heaven. The things that, if, in fact, we are told the things that he was shown there are not things to be told to men. But then Apostle Paul still says, I want to know him. I want to know him. I think Apostle Paul was still yearning for more. And you, and you see one thing about the Lord. The more you know him, the more you want to know him. The more you get closer to him, you realize you want to know him. The other day I was telling some people, if I explain God and you understand him, he ceases to be God. Because God must remain mysterious. God must remain, as in when we think we know him, he becomes mysterious so that we can do what? So that we can do, we can know him even more. And this is what Apostle Paul says, not that I've already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that which also was, I, was, uh, I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of upward call of God in Christ Jesus. He goes on to say that we should have the same attitude. We all need to fight against spiritual complacency. We see the same thing in Moses' experience in the text that we read earlier. The lesson we draw from that experience of Moses is that no matter where you are spiritually, you should desire to recalibrate in his presence and go deeper in God. Since God is infinite, we can always know him more deeply. And so, Sita Meldoret, I urge you to press on. I can't deal with everything in this amazing text. And so I'm limiting myself to only five lessons and I will take leave. Five things I want us to draw from the text in Exodus 33 and of course a little bit of 34. Five things and I will take leave. Number one, 
to recalibrate in his presence, you need a holy dissatisfaction with where you are at. To recalibrate in his presence, you need a holy dissatisfaction with where you are at. Moses says, show me your glory. You need to be hungry and thirsty for God like Moses. Are you satisfied with where you are as a Christian? Are you satisfied that now you have risen to the point you are a safari group leader? You have risen to the point that you are in a certain committee or you are a HOD or you are holding some church leadership and so you think you have arrived. You need to be hungry and thirsty for God like Moses. There is a sense in which we should be content with the Lord, of course, as we read in Psalm 23, verse 1, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. We have all that we need in life and godliness in him, as we read in 2 Peter 1, 3. But with Moses, we should pray. Now, therefore, I pray, if I have found favor in your sight, let me know your ways that I may know you, that I may find favor in your sight. The Lord assured Moses that he would grant him this request. But Moses wasn't content with it. So he continued in Exodus 33 verse 18. I pray, show me your glory. This was not a prayer for material comforts. This was not a prayer for good health. It wasn't a prayer for success in ministry. It was a prayer to know God more deeply. I want to ask Brother Moses, what more could you want? You are the man who talked with God at the burning bush. You saw God's mighty miracles in Egypt. You saw him part the Red Sea. You saw manna come from heaven. As a matter of fact, you struck a rock and water gushed out. You saw God's glory when you and 70 elders of Israel went up to the mountain and ate and drank in God's presence. You spent 40 days on the quaking, cloud-covered mountain where you met personally with God. I'm talking to Brother Moses. And you are the same person who was given 10 commandments. God often spoke to you face to face at the tent of meeting. Isn't that enough, Moses? No. Moses replies, no. I want to see the glory of God in a deeper way. I pray that becomes our challenge. I pray that becomes our clarion call. I pray that becomes our prayer. Sita Meldoret, that we are crying, God, we want to see more of you. I want us to come to that place we will tell God, yes, we've been around for 10 years, but we want to see more of you. A.W. Pink, in his book, Gleanings in Exodus, page 340, says, and I quote, This is both the longing of the redeemed and the goal of their redemption, to behold the glory of God, end of quote. It is the same thing the Apostle John wrote in Revelation 21, verse 22 and 23. He says, I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God, the Almighty, the Lamb, are his temple. And the city has no need for the sun or the moon to shine in it. For the glory of God illuminates that, uh, it has illuminated it and it is, its lamp is the lamb. In reply in, to Moses' request, 
The Lord answered. We see the answer in Exodus 33, verse 19. He says, I myself will make all goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show compassion on whom I will show compassion. The Lord's name reflects to all, or refers to all that he is, and all that he does. It is the sum of his attributes and his actions. But then, the Lord also qualifies his reply in verse 20. He says, you cannot see my face, for no man can see me and live. Then he told Moses, verse 21 to 23, behold, there is a place near by me, and you shall stand there on the rock, and I will come about while my glory is passing by, that I will put you on the cleft of the rock to, and cover you with my hand until I have passed. Then I will take my hand away, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. The Lord promised to cover Moses with his hand so that he would, not, he would survive the experience and to reveal part of his glory to Moses. Of course, face and back are human terms applied to God. Augustus Topaldi in his hymn, Rock of Ages, and of course, Fanny Cosby's hymn, He Hideth My Soul, Come from these verses when we sing Rock of Ages, cliff for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Oh, we sing Fanny Cosby's song, Hi, he, he hideth me. All is a reference to these verses. Christ is the rock that followed Israel through the wilderness. While that refers to Christ as the rock from which the water flowed, it may still be valid to see God hiding Moses in Christ. From that vantage point, he got a glimpse of God's glory. But of course, when we go to John 1.14, it declares to us, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as, the, as, the, as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. So by coming to know Jesus, more deeply. We see more of God's glory. The more you desire to know about him, the more you desire to know about him, the more you desire to go deeper, the more you desire just to familiarize yourself with the character of, your, of his testimonies. Then he reveals himself to you day by day. As you feed daily on God's word, Ask him to reveal more and more of Christ to your soul. No matter how long you've been a Christian, with Paul and Moses, I'm asking you tonight, have a holy dissatisfaction with where you are so that you can recalibrate in his presence and tell him, Lord, show me your glory. But number two, to recalibrate in his presence, you need to understand his abundant goodness. You need to understand his abundant goodness. When Moses asked to see God's glory, the Lord did not give him a vision of his throne or his throne room. With an imp with the impressive seraphim, as we let us see in Isaiah chapter six, or the four scary living creatures with fire and lightning and spinning wheels, as we see in Ezekiel. Rather, the Lord gave Moses propositional statements about his attributes. He says, in effect, okay, if you want to see, if you want to see me, if you want to know more of me, if you want to see my glory. Let me show you some of my attributes, especially as they relate to saving sinners. He says, I myself will make all my goodness pass before you and proclaim the name of the Lord before you. God's goodness is an attribute that underlies all that he is in person and all that he does towards his creation. When you know him deeper, 
when you recalibrate in his presence and of course our theme this year is in his presence if you abide in me then you'll bear much fruit one of the things that happens is you understand that God is good help me preach to your neighbor and tell them God is good you see, we are here because of his goodness. I stand here today because of his goodness. If it were not for the goodness of the Lord, I should not even be standing before you. But I stand here because of his goodness. And that is what Satan tries to do to us. In the Garden of Eden, Satan's first ploy was to tempt Eve to doubt God's goodness. When you have like a small problem, when you have an issue that is troubling you, what the devil does is that he tries to ask you, if God was good, why are you sick? If God is good, why is this happening to you? If God is good and does the same thing that he comes and tempts Adam and Eve, Because the serpent said in Genesis 3, 1, Indeed, as God said, you shall not eat from the tree or, or, or any tree of the garden. And then he continues, For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. In other words, God is trying to restrict you, Adam. His commandments are denying something that would be good, would, would, would be for, you, for your good. And Eve took the bait. And Satan has been using the same tactic ever since. Because if he can make you doubt God's goodness, then you won't trust God. And that's why we will run up and down. We forget to come to church. We forget to run to God. Because we, Satan has already get, painted a picture of a God who is, I don't know, who sits somewhere and just waiting for you to do something. Then he can do what? He can hit you. When the Lord passed by Moses... As he was hidden in the cleft of the rock, he further proclaimed his goodness. We see that in 34, verse 6 to 7. Then the Lord passed in front of him and proclaimed, The Lord, the God, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth. Who keeps loving kindness for thousands? Who forgives iniquity, transgression, sin, yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting iniquity of the fathers on the children and the grandchildren to the third and fourth generation. Those verses are cited frequently in the Old Testament as a basic revelation of who God is. God's goodness includes his compassion. As we see in Psalm 103 verse 8, David cites the same. And of course, Exodus, David cites Exodus 34 verse 6 and he adds in the same in Psalm 103 verse 13 to 14. Just as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he himself knows our frame. He is mindful that we are dust. The picture is that of a father who recognizes that his three-year-old has reached his limit. His difficult behavior is because he's only three and he's tired and hungry. So rather than lashing out his son, the father tenderly says, I know that you're tired and hungry. We are going to meet your needs. But meanwhile, you need to be more cooperative. God deals with us as a compassionate father. God's goodness includes his grace. More on this in a moment. But now I will say that his grace means that he shows us undeserved favor. God's goodness means that he is slow to anger. God's goodness means that he is patient. God's goodness means he doesn't yell at us every time we mess up. He doesn't say that God is never angry. But rather, he is slow to anger. Many times in the Bible, God's anger burned against his people. But it was only when, he repeatedly seen, when they repeatedly sinned 
after many warnings. God's goodness also means that he's abounding in loving kindness and truth. Loving kindness refers to God's loyal, steadfast love, which is everlasting. Allow me to move to number three. To recalibrate in his presence, you need to understand his sovereign grace. To recalibrate in his presence, you need to understand his sovereign grace. It is significant that when God revealed this glimpse of his glory to Moses, the first thing he said was in Exodus 33, 19, I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show compassion on whom I will show compassion. He didn't say, as some think, he said that I will be gracious to everyone and compassionate to everyone. Rather, he's, rather the sovereign Lord, he gives grace to whom he wills and compassion to whom he wills. And this is of first importance in knowing who God is. He deals with us differently. The way he forgives is different. The way he loves is different. The way he deals with us is different. He is sovereign in dispensing his grace and compassion. And that is what God expects us to be. The more we get closer to him, the more we know him, the more he shows us our frailties, the more he shows us our sins, the more he shows us that we are dust, like dust, the more he reveals to us that we are nothing. And we become like Isaiah. And we say, I'm a man of unclean lips. The more we meet him, the more we go closer to him, then we desire that we cannot judge people. We cannot point fingers at people. Friends, are we talking about recalibrating in his presence? Hello? Did you lose me somewhere? But number four, time is against me. To recalibrate in his presence, you need to understand his holiness. You need to understand his forgiveness. You need to understand his justice. The Lord said in Exodus 34 verse 7, that he forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin, yet he will by no means leave the guilty and punished, visiting the iniquity of fathers on the children and the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. The Hebrew words translated iniquity, transgression, and sin have different nuances. Iniquity means to turn aside from what is right. But transgression is a more defiant violating of God's covenant. And sin is a general term for any moral failure. But the Lord piled up the three terms to show that no matter how great our sin may be, his grace is even greater. You didn't hear me. No matter how great your sin may be tonight, his grace is even greater. It doesn't matter how deep you've gotten into sin. It doesn't matter how Satan has pushed you away from God or how your sin has pushed you away from God. I want to announce to us tonight that his grace is still sufficient. Thank you for that, amen. No wonder the songwriter wrote and sang, there is a fountain flowing from Emmanuel's veins, when sinners plunge into it. Friends, there is grace available tonight. Probably most of us would like the verse to stop there, but that's only the first part of what God says. He adds, yet, he will by no means leave the guilty and punished, visiting the iniquity of fathers on the children and the, on the grandchildren. This reflects God's holiness. This reflects God's justice. This reflects who God is. 
But remember, this is also part of God's goodness. He would not be good if he were not absolutely holy. And he would neither be good nor holy if he were not just. We must impose the just payment on every sin. We recognize this even with fallible human judges. Friends, fifthly and lastly, to recalibrate in his presence, you need to be concerned, not just for yourself, but for all of God's people. You need to be concerned, not just for yourself, but for all of God's people. When Moses prayed to see God's glory, it was not a self-centered prayer. He wasn't praying, I don't care if all these complaining idol worshippers die in the wilderness, just show me your glory. Rather, he was praying as the mediator of God's covenant with Israel. We've already seen how Moses was willing to be blotted out of God's book of life if God didn't or wouldn't forgive people's sin with the golden calf that you can read in Exodus 32, 32. So here he prays in Exodus 34, verse 9, If now I have found favor in your sight, O Lord, I pray, let the, let the Lord go along in our midst, even though the people are obstinate and pardon on our iniquity and our sin. Take us as your own possession. He was thinking about others and not himself only. Recalibrating in his presence is not just that you will have a deeper experience with him. Your desire to recalibrate in his presence should be so that he can use you more effectively in helping others experience his abundant grace and know him deeply. Moses' response to God's revelation of his glory was Exodus 34 verse 8. To make haste to bow low towards the earth and worship, we see Moses quickly falls down on the ground to worship God. And that should be our response too. The point of recalibrating in his presence is not so that we can know more theology or we can win theological arguments or debates or brag about our knowledge. The point is that we will worship our sovereign God gracious God more deeply. Moses' response reminds me of Paul's response. Describing, after describing God's sovereign grace. But just to finish, you may be sitting there and asking, so what are you telling us, Pastor? And probably I even lost you at the second point. I will give you only one thing. And then we'll get to a time of prayer. One thing. To recalibrate in his presence, you must grow intolerant of the status quo. You didn't hear me. You must grow intolerant of the status quo. You must get to that point you say you are tired of that kind of life you have. You are tired of that kind of dry, dryness in your, in your Christian life. You must get to that point like Paul and say, I want to know more. You must get to that point you say, enough is enough. And you see, this does not happen by us asking you to come for prayer. This does not happen by any one of us laying hands on you. Look at this story. Esau comes home and he finds that Jacob has taken everything that belonged to him. And he asks his father, you mean there is nothing left? And the father tells him, I'm sorry, this guy took everything. 
And that's how he's left there wondering, what shall I do? But his father tells him something. And that's what I want to finish with. He tells him, when you grow tired, hmm? when you do what? When you grow tired, or when you become restless, or the message version says, when you can't take it anymore, you will throw this yoke off your shoulders. Who was to throw off the yoke on Esau's shoulders? Who was to do it? No, just help me. Who was to do it? Himself. If you want to deal with that situation, it is for you to say, enough is enough. It's for you to say, I have had enough and I can't take it anymore. I usually give this story, and Pastor Buire, allow me to give this story, personal story. 1986, while in class eight, I hurt my right foot, and I developed a wound, a wound that stayed on the whole year, because it happened early January, and up to December 1986, I had that wound. And I went to high school with that wound. I couldn't wear socks because well, water was gushing out of the wound. And for almost 18 months, it was embarrassing. I couldn't do anything. And I remember 1987, I was lying at Maseno Hospital. And I remember very well, it was August, because it was during the fourth All-Africa Games. And while lying there, the doctors had made a decision that my right leg will be cut from the knee to save my life. And I remember very well my mother coming to encourage me at Maseno Hospital telling me, be encouraged, take heart. Your, your grandfather Abednego was buried minus one leg. Your other grandfather Musa was buried minus one leg. Take heart. And I looked at her on that bed. I said, excuse me. I am not going to carry the baton of people who are buried minus one leg. I said, it stops with me. 1987, August, to date, I stand here with two legs because I said, it stops with me. You must get to that point you say, it stops with me. You must get to that point you say, enough is enough. You must get, even when, you know, people have a way of relating issues. They see a sickness and they tell you, you know, this, this, is, this is like the thing that killed your uncle. Oh, even auntie so-and-so died of this disease. And this is something, and they want to relate you. And, and we proudly talk about it and we can even say oh this is our thing it happens in our family oh people never get married oh you know in our family we never get children oh you know in our family we are used to miscarriages and so we carry this load and we are like we are okay with it you must get to that point you say enough is enough shaken and shaken enough is enough i can't take it anymore that's what esa was told that when you become restless, when you become tired, you will get this yoke off your shoulders. Because you cannot change what you can tolerate. You didn't hear me. You cannot change what you can tolerate. As long as you are comfortable in that place, as long as you are comfortable with that situation, as long as you are comfortable with that disease or that sickness, as long as you can even, even name who died of it in your family. I wish I had time, I would tell you that my brother got the same. And the, 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 the way out was only one. I forced him to get born again. I may have forced him, but I told him if you get born again, Eh? I'll pray for you 
and this thing will disappear and you will have two legs. He has two legs. I may have forced him to get born again. He's still born again, but he has. <laughs> you must decide. Shall we rise up on our feet? I wish the worship team was here to help us.